So we're going to cover a lot of ground. And uh, based on the lunch discussion, I already regret taking a couple of slides out. So I'm going to jump right in. And my clicker is going to work right now. <laughs> and we lost the sound, so if we can get it back. Uh, this is the map, just to remind you, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, that I drew back in uh, 2003, based on work I'd done all the way back to the Center for Naval Analysis in the mid-1990s. Uh, looking at all the times U.S. forces sent abroad, since the end of the Cold War, all the little dots on the map, too hard to read, roughly 150 times we've done it. And of course, every time we have a bad experience, we're told never again, never going to do that again. But of course, we keep doing it because that's what we do. What I did was I drew a line around 95% of it and got this shape, equatorially centric. And I asked the question, what is it about these parts of the world that attracts U.S. military power time and time again? Because they don't all have oil, but they do tend to rely on commodities for export-driven growth, which is a hard way to grow an economy. And it's often an unstable way to run a polity. What I decided was I was looking at the frontier of globalization on the outside functioning core, Old West, North America, Western Europe, industrialized Asia, those three billion new capitalists in the East, including China. So when I briefed this, November 2001, to Rumsfeld's people, it was a little bit of an adjustment to think about it in those terms. Less radical now. And rising pillars in the South. Two-thirds of humanity, 90% of the global GDP. You can do the math. The chunk in the middle I call the non-integrated gap, meaning not as much connectivity, fewer rules, more violence. That's one-third of humanity living on about 10% of global GDP. Big surprise, the violence is inside here. And all that connectivity and wealth on the outside means very little violence. I maintain the gap is going to be overwhelmingly shrunk through peaceful means. Sometimes military power is applied. I think the Balkans in the 90s were the model. And we successfully took a chunk off that in picture. I think the uh, rerun in Libya, the same sort of model, as opposed to Iraq and Afghanistan, highly successful. And the way we're going to do it in the future. A mantra from the first book, Disconnectedness Defines Danger. Show me a part of the world that's less connected. And inside that shape, basically since the end of the Cold War, I can show you all the wars, all the civil wars, all the ethnic cleansing, all the mass rape as a tool of terror, all the genocide, all the children lured or forced into combat activities, virtually all the illegal narcotic exporters, all UN peacekeeping missions, all US interventions and nation building missions, all of it inside that shape. So not a neocon fantasy, and you can't vote it out of office. It's just an observed reality. <coughs> that you guys have lived. I maintain, though, this is a snapshot of a frontier integrating age. Our problem with globalization today is not that it's stagnating or deglobalizing or any of the other stuff you might have heard. It's that it continues to move very rapidly. So this gap gets shrunk out of existence next 20 years, I guarantee you. The question is how much violence is attached to the process and what are the political military outcomes? So do you want to participate or not? But the success of America's grand strategy in encouraging globalization means we're not necessary to the process anymore. It is driven by others. Good example, cell phones, 2001, looks like my old core. 2004, looks like my, my core gap, except in the penetration here. And there it is in 2008. I spent last summer in southern Ethiopia, I'll tell you, it's gone. 